I want us to think about the culture in which we live, the country in which we live, our community. And think about how it has changed over the past 20 years or 30 years or 40 or 50 years. And we'll see that our community is made up of a, a, a vast mix of different kinds of people as far as their beliefs, as far as their backgrounds, as far as their hopes and dreams and so forth. Well, that's the world that we find ourselves in here in the year 2014. A very different world than many of us experienced in the past. In Acts chapter 17, we have the familiar account of the Apostle Paul in the city of Athens. <clears throat> and in, in the city of Athens, he finds a very diverse mixture of people. We find this beginning, and we'll start reading in verse 16 of Acts chapter 17. Verse 16 of Acts chapter 17. It's recorded now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, <clears throat> his spirit was provoked with them when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and his resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you're bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now, in those sh short verses, we are introduced to a variety of people that Paul encountered in the city of Athens. There were philosophers. There were Jewish worshipers. There were Gentile worshipers. There were all kinds of different people with different beliefs, different backgrounds that were there in the city. And so Paul would reason with them. He reasoned with them every day, whoever he found, and he would find all kinds of different people. When I was growing up, <clears throat> and if I would have went around to this this city or this community, I would have found that the vast majority of people would have believed in the God of the Bible. They would have believed that Jesus was his son. They would have believed that the Bible was true, that it came from God. They would have believed uh, in heaven. They would have believed in hell. They would have believed uh, that there is a judgment day based upon the decisions we make in this world and a number of other things. Well, that simply isn't true anymore. Tonight, and Lord willing, the next two Sunday nights, I want to focus on a particular group of people that no doubt we have encountered uh, in various places, maybe some in our family, some of our friends, neighbors, maybe co-workers, people at school, that might fit into this category. A few months ago, I kind of introduced this topic in just a, uh, a one sermon or a one topic sermon, but tonight I want to elaborate on this uh, because this group of people is very different than people maybe of 30 or 40 years ago. According to James Emery White in his book, The Rise of the Nuns, which was just recently published. The fastest growing religious group in America are the nuns. And by nuns, I mean N-O-N-E-S. These are what are commonly referred to as those with no religious affiliation. None whatsoever. Well, in his book, the author describes who the nuns are and what they believe and what they don't believe. Part one. In part two, he describes ways that these people can be approached, that, that you can communicate 
with these people in an endeavor to help them to come be to uh, believe the Bible and to believe in Christ and to believe in heaven and hell and to believe in, in sin and so forth. That's part two. And at the very end of the book, he, he, he has a great section on what it means to judge. And that will be part three. He's done an incredible amount of research. Much of this coming out of just the past couple of years. Surveys and uh, polls and so forth of people and their religious beliefs or unbeliefs. This group basically consists or comprises 20% of the U.S. population. Now that should be a staggering number to most of us. 20%. Every One out of every five people we meet would fit into that category. That's a lot of people just here in Granby that would fit in. And we're, of course we're talking about people of an age who, who uh, would know what they believe and could report their beliefs in some sort of intelligent way. So, we need to listen because this is a very significant part of America. And basically, this group, for the most part, did not exist when I was growing up, period. They just didn't exist. Everybody was affiliated religiously with something. Very, very few people around here weren't. Well, this group has really increased in numbers in the past 10 to 20 years. They've just, it's just, they've gone off the chart. It's amazing how many people are reporting that they are religiously unaffiliated. So tonight we want to focus on who these people are. So when we meet them, we will know. And we'll know what they believe. And we'll know in many cases why they believe it and what has influenced them. If we want to reach them, and I, and I think we surely do, then we need to know about this. Just like Paul being in Athens almost 2,000 years ago, meeting all kinds of different people, he had to be prepared to approach and, and connect and, and converse with a host of different beliefs. So must we. Very different than the past. Very, very different. And so a lot of this material will come from, from research, from polls, from opinion surveys, uh, of what these people believe. And there has been a tremendous amount of work done, research done, about these. I'm kind of describing this in, in, in five different main ways. The first one has to do with, <clears throat> with uh, basically who they are. First of all, these nuns, the people that answer on religious surveys that they have no affiliation with religion. They don't care about religion, nor do they oppose it. In other words, they're not anti-religion. And, and that's one of the most important things to understand about the nuns. They're not against religion, they're just not for it. Essentially, they don't care. They don't care about religion. If you want to be religious and go to church, that's fine with them. They don't care. If you don't want to go, that's fine. They don't care. Religion is just not relevant to them. It just doesn't matter to them at all. Whether they believe something or whether someone else believes something, they simply don't care. Now, years ago... There was a group in America that were changing religious faiths. In other words, they would be relieved, re, leaving one religious faith and going to another. The nuns 
almost exclusively were associated at one time with a religion of, of some kind. But they left that religion, but they didn't go anywhere else. So it's not like they changed religion, they abandoned religion. And again, that's a huge point to understand about these 20% of basically American adults. 20%. They've simply abandoned religion. They haven't changed religions. They've simply quit. And the thing about this, this is almost exclusively an American phenomenon. This is not found really anywhere else in the world. Exclusively in the United States. And we may be able to look at some of the reasons why that's exclusively an American uh, phenomenon. The second is when we get down, the second way of describing them has to do with some of their particular, well, surveys call them demographics, but it's about who they are physically first. Uh, typically, they're males. There's many more males, men in this group of religiously unaffiliated than there are women. Many more men than women. They're also primarily young, under 35. Primarily young. They're primarily white, much more so than uh, other uh, races. They're not atheists. Most all of these people believe in God, what they might call God. Now remember, they've abandoned religion but they've not abandoned the concept of God. Another very important point. They tend to favor abortion. They favor same gender marriage as well. So on the surveys, on the opinion polls, those that check the none category tend to believe in those things. Also, more of them live in the western part of the United States than any other part of our country. Many of these nuns consider themselves spiritual, and we'll talk about what they mean by that shortly. But they consider themselves spiritual. They, they don't consider themselves unspiritual or strictly secular. They, they do consider themselves spiritual, but they say they are not religious. All right, spiritual but not religious. More about that in a minute. And many of these nuns, even though they don't attend any type of church service, they're not affiliated with any religion, many of them pray every day. So again, they believe that they're spiritual in some sense, but not religious as far as following a particular religious group found in America. Also, the nuns <clears throat> are not seekers. I remember, especially back in the 90s, uh, so many churches in big cities were calling themselves seeker churches. And basically that meant that that they were trying to find all of those people who were seeking some new religion, some new denomination, some new faith. But the nuns are not seeking religion. Why? Because they don't care about religion. Again, they're not opposed to it, they're not against it, but they just don't want anything to do with it. So they're not seeking religion. They're not looking for a specific faith, they're not looking for a specific religion. They are content with their idea of spirituality as it is. <clears throat> According to a 2011 Baylor University religion survey, 44% said they spend no time, none whatsoever, seeking eternal wisdom. Now, think about that. That's almost half. 44%, and this was just 2011, they spend zero time every day seeking eternal wisdom. 
None. In another uh, religious survey, 46% of the people said they never wonder whether they will go to heaven or not. Never, never think about it. It's kind of a side note in a sense, but when you look at what people are thinking about or not thinking about, it's no wonder that there are so many of the nuns out there that aren't affiliated with any religious group at all. It's not surprising. When that large a percentage of people are not thinking about eternity, they, don't, they never think about the afterlife, they never think about whether they're going to heaven or not, never crosses their mind. Almost half. The third topic about the nuns that we need to think about when we meet people, one in five, 20 percent, is that many, there's many ideas, there's many philosophies that has helped increase the number of nuns. And remember, especially, these were the people that grew up in the 90s and in the early 2000s. All right, And that has a lot to do with, with how they were influenced. So that's the time period they kind of grew up in. And so there's a lot of things that have happened, a lot of ideas, a lot of philosophies, a lot of teachings that have caused their number to increase. Uh, one that has had a huge impact, according to, to research, is the emphasis on evolution in so many organizations. And by organizations, I mean education, from preschool all the way to graduate school. It wasn't emphasized at all when I was growing up. I took a class in zoology in school, which today is all based upon evolution if you took it today. When I took it, <clears throat> my professor who believed in evolution mentioned it, you know how many times? Once. The entire semester. One time. Whereas today it would be mentioned almost every class period. See the difference in emphasis? It's emphasized in the media in so, so many ways. And it's had an impact because these nuns, remember they're primarily in their 20s and early 30s, <clears throat> grew up in a time when media had especially such a huge impact and influence on people. So the media, whether it was movies, whether it was TV, uh, papers and journals, of course the, the internet as far as for most people, kind of started during that time period. So they were inundated with it. And then, of course, government, obviously, uh, in the past 20 years, has uh, used evolution in a number of ways to influence this group of people to where they don't have any religious affiliation at all. So there is a, a huge change in America in the past 20 years that has certainly had an effect on influencing vast numbers of people to leave religion and have no religious affiliation at all. Of course, in the 90s was a huge secular emphasis uh, in the world uh, on, uh, on things of the world, um, making money regardless of how you made it, um, all kinds, of course, scandals uh, in the past 20 years uh, in the business world that's had a huge effect on these people as well. And, of course, during the past 20 years, we can think about the, the number of very well-known preachers on TV, whether we call them televangelists or not, who were uh, found out to have either been uh, immoral, immoral acts with different people, or uh, they were shown to have been tax evaders, or 
they were shown to have completely abused so much of the money that was sent into them. Those people had an effect on the nuns. Because these people saw these preachers and televangelists on TV and so forth and then lived through, whether it was trials or whatever, what these people did. It turned them off religion. It turned them off of, of being affiliated with religious groups. <clears throat> no wonder. And as a result, during this same period of time in the past 20 years, <clears throat> Christians have been perceived, especially through the media, as being unloving, uncaring, unconcerned, hypocritical, hypercritical, uh, in so many different ways. Whether they were Christians <clears throat> on TV, Christians in politics, Christians here, Christians there, that, that's how they were perceived uh, and displayed by so many people in the media. Those were just some of the influences during the, this past two decades that no doubt has had a serious effect and influence on this group of people so that so many of them have turned to where they have no affiliation with any religion whatsoever. Number four is that <clears throat> the nuns are living in what some call a post-Christian nation. That's a very common expression for our country now. It's a post-Christian nation. One where the very memory of the gospel is becoming non-existent. Where you ask John Doe on the street or Mary Smith on the street some basic questions about the, the Bible, about the gospel, and, and they just have no idea whatsoever. Well, that's had a, that, that's been a big change in our country, uh, since the 60s and 70s. And even the 80s. The past 20 years, so many people just have no knowledge of the Bible, of God's Word at all. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Remember the old prophet? It's not surprising. So post-Christian. Three factors that are helping to turn America into a post-Christian nation. First of all, Christianity is losing its place as the dominant belief or world view. When I was growing up, Christianity was by far the dominant belief and worldview, not only in, in, in this part of the country, but throughout the country. Yeah, there were some others, but Christianity was the dominant one. And that, of course, Christianity has lost ground, and I'm talking about it in the entire Christendom, has lost major ground. And, of course, many people in the world and or in America don't think that faith is relevant anymore at all. <clears throat> the second factor making this a post-Christian nation is that many influential people in our country, and those people can be in the entertainment world, the education world, the government, you know, media, whatever, sports. These people are telling others in our nation that one's faith is to be practiced in private, never in public. They are telling people, do not ever mention your faith in public. If you want to have a religious belief, fine, but don't ever tell anyone about it. You keep it to yourself and you don't ever bring it up when you're in any sort of public gathering. You keep it to yourself. Don't dare say that you're a Christian or that you're this or you're that. So these people have grown up hearing that from influential people and they have been influenced by them. Spiritual things are never to be placed in the public arena. You keep it 
quiet. One is to not even talk about their faith publicly. That is just forbidden according to these people. So no wonder people are so religiously unaffiliated today. One in five. The third factor, people today are confronted with a huge number of religions and faiths and philosophies and ideologies that compete for their attention. Just think about it. When I was growing up, I could maybe think of 20. <laughs> maybe. Nowadays, thousands and thousands of ideas and beliefs are out there at the click of a button. You know, you just type in religion to Google. And oh my, will you get a wide variety of websites. And many of these simply didn't exist 50 years ago. So these nuns have been influenced by so many of these different groups. And so what would they naturally think? Well, if there's this many faiths and this many religions and this many ideologies and so forth, then obviously it doesn't make any difference. The idea of there being one out there is just taken off the table. That's not possible. With thousands and thousands out there, how could there be only one? Only one way. How could there possibly be only one way? So for many then, in our nation, all the ideas about truth, if someone says they have truth, their truth claims are valid. Okay. If this religious group says this is the way to peace and happiness, and this is the way to their idea of heaven or nirvana or whatever, then that's a valid claim. And if another group says, this is the way to paradise, then that's valid as well. So for these people growing up during this time, and they're seeing all these competing beliefs and religions, no wonder they've gotten to the point where they're just not associated with any of them because there's so many different ways to Heaven to paradise. And then in the last one, <clears throat> America has been, I use the term bombarded. You may choose another term, but bombarded, been bombarded by the spiritual but not religious teachers. They're everywhere on TV. They're everywhere in books. They're everywhere on the radio. They're everywhere on the internet. And they're very, very popular. From the, 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 the Deepak Chopras to the Eckhart Tolls and, and over and over and over, these people who are spiritual, they claim, but not religious. But not religious. And of course, some of these are, uh, you would put in the New Age category, but not all of them. And when you look at some of the beliefs of the nuns, you'll see where some of their beliefs have came from. Listen to these. <clears throat> of the nuns, these are just the nuns, those one in five, religiously unaffiliated. Three out of ten, 30% of them, believe that physical objects possess spiritual energy. A rock or a piece of wood or whatever. Possess spiritual energy. 25% believe in astrology and reincarnation. One in every four of the nuns believes in astrology and reincarnation. Six out of ten, 60% say they have a deep connection with nature and this earth. And by a deep connection, uh, there's a lot could be said about that, but that this world should be in some ways reverenced and worshipped. And then three out of ten of the nuns have felt in touch with someone who is dead. 
They, they, in some ways, they've been in touch with them. And then 15% of the nuns have consulted a psychic. So you see where these spiritual but not religious teachers have influenced the nuns. They've influenced them in a many, in many ways. <clears throat> so as a result of the, the idea that someone can be spiritual and not religious, is that, going back kind of what we said, there are many, many truths out there. And it's all right, according to these teachers, and, and again, their, their books have been New York Times bestsellers, especially those two that I mentioned. Uh, but but they're they're referenced in in uh, in movies and and on the internet and so forth. People can create truth for themselves, despite the facts, not because of the facts, but despite the facts. You can create your own truth, and therefore that truth becomes valid for you. That's what many of the spiritual but not religious teachers say. Truth is truth for you. Doesn't have to be truth for me or anyone else. It can be truth for you. And truth can be whatever the majority believe to be true. And of course, this is seen with the idea of the Holocaust, of course. If enough people say the Holocaust never happened, then it never happened. So if you don't believe it happened, then it didn't happen for you. And you don't have to believe it. See, that's what many of these spiritual but not religious teachers try and say. That has influenced these people, the nuns, so that they're not affiliated with any religion. And of course, when you start to say that there's all different types of truths, then the logical outcome is that there's no right and wrong. What's right for you might be wrong for me. What's right for me might be wrong for you. And that's okay, according to them. So morals are strictly relative. There, there are no moral absolutes at all. Morality is just a personal choice. And that's the belief of many of the nuns. That's who these people are. One in five, 20% of the people have these beliefs. And they've been influenced to a great degree by so many things that's happened in the past 20 years. In some ways, I'm surprised it's not greater than 20%. But one in five. So that's the first thing is to know who they are. If we're going to connect with them, if we're going to try and talk with them and and, and tell them about our beliefs and why we believe it and try to help them come to understand it and believe it as well, we must understand who they are and what they believe and especially why they believe it. Why they believe it. And for many of them, it simply comes down to not necessarily believing in God or believing in a religion or believing in a faith. They end up just believing in themselves. And it's about me. And that's where it ends. Nothing else. If we're going to be effective, and if we really want to reach people, we must, like Paul did in Acts 17... We're going to meet all kinds of people. For Paul, there were Jewish worshipers, Gentile worshipers. Well, that was only two groups. Then there were different types of philosophers. He had to reason with them. There were all kinds of people he met in the marketplace. And that's the way it will be for us as well. One in five of the people we meet will have no religious affiliation whatsoever. None. They don't attend any religious service of any kind ever. They certainly don't read any type of, of uh, religious book ever, whether it's considered sacred and holy or not. 
They don't give money to any type of religious organization and so on. So the people we meet and, and contact, one in five could very well be one of the nuns. And this lesson was to help us understand them and why they believe or don't believe what they do. Paul had a little positive result in Athens. Not a lot, but some. And there are some people that truly are wanting to know and wanting to understand. And as Peter says, it's our responsibility to be able to give them an appropriate answer, a good answer, an accurate answer based upon God's word. And by helping to know who they are and what they believe, we can better be equipped to do that very thing. Tonight, Dean has chosen a particular invitation song to help us focus on our lives and our behavior. And if there is a need in anyone's heart, anyone's mind to respond to that wonderful invitation, then I certainly encourage you to do that as we stand and sing this song.